Let's jump into recording in progress. some materials here. Um, so I had introduced last time scale-free networks, and my intention was to clean up that a little bit and, and finish uh, this topic. So does anyone remember the basic uh, situation captured by scale-free networks? What, what, what it, when we talked about scale-free networks, what was their primary sort of feature that they captured? What was the, the notable aspect of the situation that a scale-free network captures? Anyone? Yes, name? Alex. Alex. Most people have a lot of connections where some people have a lot of connections. Exactly. Most people don't have a lot of connections, but a few people have tons. And I challenged you to start thinking about cases like this. And we'll get back to that um, in a minute. Particularly cases where having something allows you to get more of it really easily. I'll come back to this in a minute. But scale-free networks um, have this feature that a lot of the, in this case, connections are concentrated in just a small portion of the population. And you may say, well, okay, the vast majority of people don't have very many connections, so surely they're gonna dominate. And the insight from scale-free networks, and we'll see it borne out mathematically, at least at an informal level today, is actually, it's a mistake to think just because the vast majority of people have few connections, that means that they dominate the situation. In the case of scale-free networks, it's often the people who have the very small fraction of the population who has lots of connections that dominate the situation. They're the tail that wags the dog. They're the, the small subset that makes all the difference. Um, and I gave some reasons for this last time. You know, if someone has a lot of connections, they are at once a magnet for infection. I mean, after all, they have lots of, lots of connections. And so even if one of those connections is infected, they're going to get infected, right? So, you know, if someone's, someone's interacting with, you know, uh, 75 sexual partners over one year period, just one of those has chlamydia, they have a pretty good chance of catching chlamydia. Um, so they're likely to, to get infected if they are a salesperson who sees hundreds of people a day as part of their job or someone, you know, running buses as an essential worker and they see tons of people, they're, they're more likely to get infected in the first place. But they're also more likely, if they do get infected, to pass it on to another person. So there are magnets for infection and dissemination of machines that pass this on very widely. That's really the, the risk here. And this is one of the reasons they have way disproportionate impact. Um, these high contract rate individuals can be very distinctive from your average person in the population. Um, and you know, you can if you focus on them and for, for your efforts, maybe it's a safe sex campaign, maybe it's provide masks for them or, or, or provide it frequent testing for them, um, better ventilation, whatever, um, uh, you can get really big gains because you really lower the chance that this bug is gonna spread quickly through them. Um, and, uh, and as it turns out, we're gonna have to figure out how to mod modify classic equations to account for this. And it turns out this heterogeneity makes a big difference. And the spoiler is that if you just look at average behavior of the population, a lot of bugs that are circulating right now, quite frequently within our very problems, would die out. If you look at the average behavior of people in the population, it wouldn't be enough to sustain it. The basic reproductive number will be less than one. It would die out, it would disappear. But it's because of certain certain subpopulations that have lots and lots of contacts. Maybe for, I mean, it, it's not necessarily bad contacts. Uh, they're living in crowded housing, for example, that, that you know, is their, their circumstance in life. Uh, they don't have access to basic resources. They have to engage in essential work. Those, you know, people who are in that situation can keep the bug alive that would otherwise go disappear in the population. So there's a lot of bugs that circulate in our population, a lot of infections 
that you would think would die out if you just look at an average analysis, but actually stay troublingly persistent because of a small fraction of the population. Uh, Peter, so, uh, uh, sorry, yes. uh, please share please. the slides for us. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I uh, am so grateful for that feedback. That's awesome, awesome. Um, so I was just in, we, we just went through these uh, these couple slides. I noted the disproportionate impact. You're not going to see the uh, the laser pointer, but down there of, of, of groups with large numbers of partners, and they they're more likely to be infected, more likely to pass it on, and so on. And I noted that these infections start or these sort of networks, you know, free networks, started to achieve a lot of attention at the start of, of this century, um, a bit over 20 years ago now. Um, and people found that once they started looking for these things, they were everywhere, everywhere. Um, collaborative networks between scientists, uh, factors involving you know, the structure of the web, um, software and the structure of software code in terms of the connectivities and dependencies in software. Um, and contact patterns between people and social connections. Um, some people are social butterflies with tons of connections, but most people have a, a modest number. So they're they're all around us. These scale-free networks, and what what distinguishes them, uh, beyond the kind of basic intuition that those who have lots of connections uh, are a small number but hugely disproportionately important. And most people have few connections, is a mathematical relationship. We're going to denote, for a given, no, think of it as a person, an agent. They have a number of, uh, of, of connections, say K. And the idea is that the chance of a person having K connections or K partners, if we were to think about uh, certain types of interaction, needle sharing or sexual interaction or what have you, is proportional to K to the minus. Uh, and for those who don't remember the requisite algebra k to the minus gamma is what? Well, how can I write this out without a minus sign? Yeah, it's one over k to the gamma, right? Um, so if, if gamma is, for example, two, this would be one over k squared. If gamma is, is three, this would be one over k, k cubed. So the bigger gamma is, the faster it goes down as you consider more and more connections. The less and less, less and less likely it is someone will have more connections, you know, the more that we concentrate in fewer connections. Now, it turns out for human sexual networks, the, the gamma is between two and three point five. Um, and, um, and, and this is notable, and there's, there's some math with it. Um, here in, in just a minute, but uh, and, and we'll get to this. But uh, here, most nodes have a small number of connections. Most have very few, but a small proportion of these many, many connections. And as we say, is there's a heavy tail. Now, this is the part I put up on the board last time. I, I wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted to clean up the presentation. So the idea here is that we call scale-free networks by that name for a reason. Um, why do we do it? It's because there's a scale invariant. There's something which doesn't change based on how much you zoom in or zoom out. It doesn't change based on scale. And what is that thing? Well, it's this, it's this relationship here, and it has to do with, with gamma. Basically, if we consider the the fraction of people that have K connections versus those that have two K connections, twice that number of connections, that ratio is always the same no matter how big K is. So if I compare the number of people of one connection versus two, or 10 versus 20, or if I compare 20 versus 40, or 100 versus 200, or 1,000 versus 2,000. The ratio of those pairs is always going to be the same, no matter how big K is. Um, and 
The basic reasons for this mathematically are shown. So if you consider, so, so I said earlier that here, the chance of having this many connections or partners is proportional to k to the minus gamma. So if we ask about the probability of having k connections, it's just some unknown constant c, it's just, just a constant times k to the minus gamma. The k to the minus gamma is just this thing here. And I said it's proportional by proportion. This is the so-called constant of proportionality. It just makes sure it adds up to one. Okay, uh, is a problem. Okay. okay, but what that means is if you just plug in, instead of just having k, you have alpha k. If I have two k, for example, alpha two. And I say, what's the probability of I mean, 2k connection. Well, I just plug it into the start equation. This equation P of k equals k to the minus gamma. Plug this into that. And, you know, I go through and I kind of chunk through the mathematics, right? Alpha to the k to the minus, minus or alpha k to the minus gamma um, is just alpha to the minus gamma times k to the minus gamma. Just sort of rearranging it, you'll see, wait a minute, this is, this is P of K. This is, this is the probability of having K connections. So the probability of having two K connections is just alpha to the minus gamma. That's a constant times having K connections. So, so if, if two, if, if alpha were two, I'm considering having two connections compared to, to, to one, it's, it's just uh, two to the minus gamma here. So if I look at the ratio of these, how many people have, 2K connections compared to K, it's always going to be this. No matter how big K is, this is just some constant. It's just a number, three or five or whatever it is. Uh, actually, it's going to always be less than one. Um, but um, it's about this. Um, so, so here, no matter how, how many how many connections we're considering? The chance of having two, twice that many connections um, compared to the chance of having k connections is always the same. It's always this ratio. And what that means is it sort of looks the same at any scale. It's just as, as you get to bigger and bigger values of k, I said p of x, you really need to get k there to be consistent. It, it kind of looks, looks the same as you get to larger and larger scales. The chance of having 2K is compared to the chance of having K is always the same. Um, this ratio is always the same. So if I'm only, if only half as many people in the population have 20 connections compared to 10, then only half as have 200 connections compared to the number that have 100 connections, and only half have 2,000 connections compared to the number that have 1,000 connections. Um, it's it's always the same ratio. Are people feeling pretty comfortable about that idea? That basically, no matter how big K is, no matter if we're considering 10 versus 20 connections or 1,000 versus 2,000, um, we always have the same ratio in the fraction of the population um, that have, have that two, twice the number versus, the, twice that number of connections versus that number of connections. People feeling okay with that? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of nodding, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on. What this leads to is long tails. Don't think of like a snake with a long tail. A horse with a long tail. Think about like it's a heavy tail, meaning it scratches its way out here to the road. Um, here, you know, most people have one or two or maybe three or four connections per year, but some people have like 70, 80, 100 connections. It stretches way to the right. It's what's called a heavy tail. It goes way out there. You might think it would disappear right here, but you'd be wrong. It, it, it stretches out. It stretches out quite far. Um, and so it is, you know, if you look at so many things, I mean, the number of connections people have as part of their daily jobs. There are some people like workers in an airport who do security screening. They're going to be like encountering thousands of people a day. Whereas, you know, a prop, there are zillions of meetings. 
So that's not a good example. But someone who's who's you know working um, working uh, in the uh, in in some critical bit of infrastructure in the power plant of a hotel or something like that is going to have a lot fewer contacts. They come in, they maintain the, uh, the power systems of the hotel, and they don't So um, this is data actually from here on campus involving contact contact tourism. How many people have contacts that are just you know 10 seconds long versus 100 seconds long versus 200 seconds long and so on and what you'll find is is the sign of of a scale free distribution it's this flat curve and i want to explain that it's this this sort of curve where does that curve come from well look i told you that the probability of having k connections here is proportional to k to the minus k that, that's why introduce these numbers. It's one of their signatures. It goes down as k to the minus k, right? We have fewer and fewer people with successively larger connections, and gamma tells us how quickly it goes down. Okay, so if this is the case, you can take the log of both sides. Take the log of p of k. We're going to put that on the y-axis here, this vertical axis. Can you see that? This vertical axis going up here. And then if we take log of p of k, then this is going to be equal to log c. Right? And if you take the log of a product, it's take the log of a product of x times y, you get log of x plus log of y, right? So log of four. Uh, you should um, we take the log base 10 of x times y, we get log of, log of x plus log of y. If x is 10, that's log of 10, y, plus the log of y, right? Um, so, so in this case, the log of k to minus gamma is just minus gamma times the log of k. And what you get is this. So here we have something that can be drawn as a line. We have log k on this axis. This is just some offset. Um, and then this, this gamma, this minus gamma is the slope down here, right? As log k increases, we're going down linearly proportional to log k. Right? This is just like a plus, you know, uh, a plus bx. You should remember that, right? The equation for a straight line, right? Um, we have a, a straight line here, and we have y equals a plus bx, right? We have some some value of y at x equals zero, and then this will go up with slope b, right? Um, so B and if B is negative, or if if we have a, a down slope here, we'll have if, if we if we had something like this, it would be going down from a certain point, right? Or we going like that. That's exactly what we Okay, so so if you have data on number of people who have different numbers of connections and you plotted them out. Using this graph, the proportion with 10 connections or 20 connections or 50 connections or three connections or whatever, if you were to plot them out the graph, the, the, the fraction of them that have different numbers of connections on a log log graph, log k on the x axis, log p of k on the y axis, this is what you would see. It's a slope like this. And lo and behold, that's what you do see. This is actually scale free over this, or there, it's associated with a power law over this portion of it. Above about 300 seconds, it starts above about five minutes, it starts to no longer be scale free. It starts to actually um, have a faster decrease than you would think. But there's a lot of conditions which are. I mean, for example, this sort of data, if you plot it out in this graph, this is what you get. Um, here's you know more data of this sort, and 
as I say, these sort of um, these sort of situations are all around us. If you were to plot out data from any of these numbers of circumstances and others, airplane flight routes, for example, um, you know the the number of flights out of certain places. You have most places um, that have comparatively few flights, most airports, and then you have some here in Canada. It would be like Toronto, probably. Um, uh, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau Airport in Montreal, um, and uh, and perhaps uh, Vancouver. Um, you have very very large numbers of connections. So in general, there's this kind of signature that comes out of this. If you plot it out this way, you see this line and log log log. Okay, and these things pop up pop out at us uh, all the time with real world data the scale-free structure. So why is that? Well, we get from many sources of One I'm not gonna talk about that. And I'm probably not gonna get a chance to finish with this course, although it, in some versions of this course, I've actually talked a little bit about it, what's called dimensional structure. But it turns out, you know, we build our computers to, to process numbers. Even in our models here, we have numbers, but those numbers mean something. Like, one means something. It's it's often like one month or one year or one person or one dollar. Um, when we have numbers and we just treat them as numbers divorced from what they mean, we can often make silly mistakes. We'll do something like add a dollar to a person, which is meaningless, right? One dollar plus one person, you could say it's two, but it, it, it means nothing. Just as much as adding one foot to one meter, you can get two, but it's meaningless. So there's no, there's no, there's no measure associated, right? There's no meter stick associated with it that that tells you what it's about. Um, numbers mean something, and units of numbers are key bits of metadata. And it turns out that when you have units within our with oh, we have units all around us in the world. And when we describe those carefully, when we really think through what the unit structure is, you find out the source of a lot of power laws. They just pop up. It has to be this way. Um, and it's actually quite remarkable what you can do with that sort of information. Some of my interests in terms of novel modeling languages are supporting that sort of structure effectively. You will actually find any logic supporting it some for system dynamics models. You can associate the different parts of a system dynamics model with dimensional information or against. But this other place it comes out of um, comes out of is what I asked you to think about. And that is um, processes where having a little bit of something lets you get more of it. Having a lot of it lets you be more likely to get more of it yet. Um, prefer it's called preferential attachment when it comes to networks. If I am a popular person, I'll tend to meet people a lot more frequently, and therefore I'll tend to have even more knowledge of friends and so on. But there's many other cases like this, and I ask you to think about cases like this, where cases where having a certain resource or a certain Attribute lets you makes it easier to get more of that attribute or more of that resource. Does anyone want to test one or two examples? Yes, can it? Yep. Uh, I say money. Money is certainly the case. And if you look at disparities in terms of income, a lot of them come from this, right? Um, it's sometimes said it's a sad version of the, the golden rule. Those who have the gold make the rules sometimes. And I overplay it a little bit, but the truth is that if you have access to, to money up front, there's a lot of things you can do that will save you money and make you money. You can invest in it. Um, someone who, who has some money can partake in certain options, maybe it's getting a car, which will actually save the money compared to 
having to, you know, take uh, take a bus every day or something like that. Or maybe, or maybe they'll be able to own a house rather than rent the house and save money that way. Um, they may be able to take that money and invest it in investment vehicles of various sorts. And and maybe it's you know renting up places to others. Maybe it's putting it into you know certain certain investing in certain companies, or maybe it's engaging in entrepreneurship. But they can they can grow more resources. So money tends to bring more money. What's another type of resource? Another type of situation or having something lets you gain more. Yes. Okay, so this is a really interesting question, and and I welcome it. Um, often the flip side, there, there's two things that are flip sides of the point when we have reinforcing feedbacks. In general, when we talk about positive feedbacks, we're not talking in a normative sense. It's a good thing. We're talking about reinforcing situations where something builds on itself over compounds and snowballs. And there's two primary features of that um, that we, we even have expressions about making. One is more common than the other. One is a virtuous cycle, and one is a vicious cycle. The vicious one is actually more common, right? Say something's in a vicious cycle, meaning adversity breeds adversity, right? So maybe someone who has very little income needs to work in jobs that put them in harm's way. Maybe it's an essential worker. Maybe it's um, in circumstances that it's it's a dangerous environment. They're working as an iron worker in construction or whatever. They're more likely to be injured and more likely on the job, therefore, to be to be unable to work effectively, and therefore, they lose income and opportunity further, and it can spiral, right? Um, and there's a lot of circumstances like this, where adversity can breed adversity. Um, people get injured, and sometimes following an injury, they, you know, they may be required to have to undertake uh, operations and, you know, they have exposure to opioids and they develop some opioid dependence and, and they're not able to hold a job effectively and it spirals. And there's a lot of cases in the world where you get adversity breeding adversity. But at the same time, you get, you know, access to resources breeding access to resources. And um, those those are not totally solitudes to each other. Some of the structural factors that mean if you don't have resources, you're you're more limited. That's what that's what cycles for the vicious cycle. Um, I'm oversimplifying the situation, but these are two sides of the point. And and in both cases, it can lead to sort of this huge dispersion where some people are are at the extremes of of poverty and marginalization and stigmatization, et cetera. Um, and, and more people have, have less problem with that and don't understand those circumstances, unfortunately. So, so yeah, it's a very good point. How about other other types of resources which tend to breed breed other access? Access to Political resources is another thing. Political strength to breed, breed political strength to become the person to get to know. You're the, the deal maker. People want to want to seek your help and, and build your own uh, research. Uh, if if you're a, a reasonably prominent researcher, people want to want to work with you um, and connect. If you have um, if you have uh, social media connections. You're, if you're a prolific LinkedIn user, or you're a prolific uh, Twitter user, or what have you, you tend tends to breed on itself. Um, think about pages found in Google search. If your page is close to the top of Google search, you're going to get a disproportionate number of people going to you, potentially linking to you, and it will tend to place you even further up to keep you sustained. The pages that are, you know, the 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 links that 
are found in a Google search only on the third or fourth page, tend to be less visited and therefore less prominent and therefore less featured on the page rank algorithms. Right? The things that get the clickbait on on Facebook in terms of inflammatory fake news or whatever, those things tend to be the ones shown and tend to be circulated more, etc. There's a lot of cases of it. Um, and uh, the, the network side of this is preferential attachment. Those who have the network connections get more of the network connections. Think of it in social media, think of it in, in other types of connections as well. Um, so there's a feedback loop here. Um, okay, so we, we talked about these basic signatures. Um, okay, so um, now this, this has some, some significance. We, I have, I have talked about the probability distribution for having k connections being proportional to k to the minus gamma. Okay, um, uh, that's what we saw earlier, right? This is what we've been dealing with. That's 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 the signature of a of a scale-free network, a power law distribution. In this, notice it's not exponent of k no 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 k is is not in the exponent it's in it's in the base it's a power law in terms of it's like k to the minus two in other words one over k squared or one over k cubed um now uh i said it's the probability of having k is proportional i said there's a constant of proportionality c well one of the things we know about the probability distribution is that it it has to be Greater than or equal to zero at all points in its value, and it also has to sum up to one. One e. So this has to sum up to one. If we consider k of, you could argue this could be k of zero in general, but we're going to start with k of one. Um, and k of zero is my effect will cause problems because it'll be one over zero. Um, but if, so if we start with k of one, we're, we're going to sum up that value of p of k from one to infinity, having one connection or two connections or three connections, and it's got to be one of those. Is the idea so that, that has the probability? Let's consider those probabilities and sum them up. It has to be equal to one. We have they're collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive. We have to have exactly one. K one, K two, or K three. So if we sum up the probabilities of that approach, there'll be one. C has to be such that this is the case. This is a, a constant of proportionality. We're going to choose a C such that P of K, if we sum it up over all possible K, will be one, which is the feature of our probabilities. Thank you, folks. You're wrong. Okay, so just dividing this through. Right, or this is a constant. We can pull it out and find it. Provide, provide through it, and, and this is what you get. Right, and all I'm doing is pulling this out in front and dividing this through, and, and everything. Right, this is that's what the value of c is. You can say, right? Thank you very much. Yes, well, that's that's the value of c. Now, this will turn out to be important. Um, this is the constant of proportionality here, just to make it sum up to one. Okay, um, so so yeah, that's uh, that's fine. But let's ask what what exactly is this? What is this sum? What's the value of this sum? We know C is one over this sum. What is the value of the sum? If we if we sum it up, well, it turns out it's not not really easy to to do this sum, but we can approximate it as an integral and. And what we actually get, if you go through and you integrate it, it's, it's not a hard thing to integrate for anyone who knows some, some um, control of calculus. What you end up getting is gamma minus one. Okay, so C, one over this thing is, I'm sorry, C itself is gamma minus one. That's kind of interesting. Um, the value of C is is equal to that. Okay, so just plugging in that for C, um, we have P of K, the probability of having K connections, 
equals gamma minus one times theta to the minus theta. Okay, you guys say, like, what, what's going on here? What's going on? Look, look, basically, we're trying to figure out what C is. And I went and I went through a rigmarole and I found out what C needed to be um, in order so P of K adds up to one. And I went and I figured out what this expression is through an integral. And basically, this is the expression for P of K. This is such that this whole thing, if you sum it up for P of one and P of two and P of three, all the possibilities, it sums up to one. Okay, I mean, big picture, that's what's going on. I don't want to, I don't want to lose you with the with with the math here. This is this is the probability distribution. A probability of having k connections is equal to like gamma minus one on a times k to the minus one. Okay, so this is just a constant. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, gamma minus one times times uh, k to the minus one. That's the that's the probability. Well, it, it turns out that that now that we know that we can figure out what its mean is. And it turns out it's the 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 mean of it, the, the sort of average k uh, is basically gamma minus one over gamma minus two. Okay, so so this is our probability distribution right here. It's right here. I I forgive me. I I, I changed the next slide to x, but this is our probability distribution. All probability distributions have a mean, right? If we have a probability distribution, a normal distribution, um, it has a mean, right? Um, if we have a Beta distribution has a mean. If we have a uniform distribution, it has a mean. Here's a uniform and it has mean values, right? Here's a normal distribution and it has a mean value, right? Every probability distribution has a mean, right? Um, the average value of it, right? Um, the expected value, if you draw things from it. So, what's the mean of this one? What's the mean of this power law distribution that comes from scale free networks? What's the mean number of connections that people have in the population? If it's if it's such that you have this sort of situation, a scale free network, or how many, what's the average number of connections people have? Well, it's this. I'd say, oh, that's that's interesting. Why is that particularly Okay. Are there certain values where this wouldn't make sense? If, and are there certain values where this would remember that K, okay, the number of connections, is only one or more? Are there, are there certain values of gamma where that's going to cause a problem? Okay. What value of gamma might cause problems for, for this? Yeah, the gamma equals two will blow up, right? Yeah. So it would say infinity, it would be that it would be like it has a mean of infinity, right? It, it, it's like and, and I'm I'm glossing over a lot of stuff, but it, it as as gamma approaches two, it sounds like it would it be implying as a as an average an infinite number of connections on average people have. It would, it would be suggesting something like that. That'd be kind of weird. Cut gamma for less than two. Is that, is that any better? What, what happens if gamma is between one and two? What would this be? It would be negative, which doesn't make sense, right? Like you can only have one connection or two connections or three connections or four connections. And it would be suggesting negative mean, which you know, doesn't. Doesn't make sense. The mean only exists for gamma greater than two. It's only meaningful for gamma is greater than two. Okay. So we need it to decrease with a certain speed. Now, some of you in, in some deep, deep recesses of your memory may remember back to discussions in class. I don't know who would have been 260. I don't know who would have been in. Um, Context of, of uh, probability course or what have you. There's these things called infinite series. Um, 
and you, you add like one over, so you sum up, right? One over k to k squared or something like that. You sum that up. So you have one over one plus one over two squared, which is four, right? Plus one over three squared, plus one over four squared, et cetera. So this is, you know, one over one plus one over four plus one over nine. And, and you can actually figure this out. But you needed at least a square here for it, for it to have a chance of, of work. It actually needs to go down faster than a square. So, so what this is saying is we need it to go down faster. Remember, gamma tells us how quickly it decreases as we consider more and more connections. If gamma is less than two, it's not going to be decreasing fast enough. So we have like a, an infinite number of connections or it's undefined number of connections on average. But what's even striking is the variance. If you compute the variance and you talk through all the necessary math, and I'm not going to do it, you're, what you get is a variance. And a square root is a, is a square, uh, sorry, a, a standard deviation is a square root is of gamma minus one over gamma minus three. And this only makes sense if gamma is three or more, or is three. No, it's a greater, greater. Um, so if gamma is, 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 not, is not greater than three, the variance won't exist. It will have like infinite variance. Okay, now that's, or, it, it, or a variance that's not, not defined. Okay, so you must say like, okay, so like, what's the big deal here? Okay, so it'll, like the mean won't exist and the variance won't exist. Well, <laughs> I mean, these things are significant because it's like, if there is some mean that's like the average person the population could have arbitrarily many connections doesn't, um, like, that's a kind of scary prospect in terms of infections. Um, and same thing with, with variance. It turns out the variability will be really important. Um, so we're going to talk now about how these things pose a really interesting result for how infection spreads. So when you have a scale-free network, when you have a network where the statistics are distributed according to the problem, you got this sort of situation where the mean is given by that and the variance is given by that. It turns out that the infection can spread a lot faster and it will spread especially fast with a smaller gamma, or a gamma close to three, it, it's going to spread a lot. So let's let's just go through this. I'm not going to go through all my remember our SIR model, right? How could you ever forget that? Um, the stuff of dreams or the stuff of nightmares? I don't know that. It's an SIR model, right? We have C beta and infectiousness, and, and you may remember we gave them nice Greek letters and Roman letters, and we we wrote out some equations. Remember that? Like this, this blue here, this was the flow from S to I, remember that? And this red flow, pink flow, is the flow from I to R, remember that? Okay, so we should have some comfort with it. And now we will take it where we've never gone before, okay? Um, okay, so um, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna start with a small step. I'm going to call mu D. Okay. We're going to call it D instead. You can think of it as duration if you want. Duration of infectious. I, I had some earlier notes with, with, with it as D, and we'll, we'll treat it as D. It's, it's the mean duration of infection. So all I've done is I've taken this equation here, this middle one, and I and I just written it up here. Okay. Um, okay, now I'm going to go through, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time here, I'm going to go through some steps which are going to be somewhat mathematically involved. And I don't expect you to follow most details of this, actually. Now, the curious among you may find this really interesting, and you may want to zero in on it. 
but I'm not going to require that for most. And I'm responsive to the request from earlier, like the list out what you might be responsible for in each lecture of the course or each module of the course. This is the, the details of this are not important, but I'll show you something which is important for you to know at the end. Okay. But just tighten your seatbelts. And if you had a situation like this, here we have this term. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to take into account variability. And take into account some people have more connections, therefore, more connections per unit time than others. If someone has, think about the person who's running central services, the bus driver, the person checking, checking IDs at the airport, they have lots and lots of connections per unit time. Whereas someone working the power plant of a major hotel has very few. They're just in the back boiler room all day or what have you. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to imagine breaking up this population into by how many contacts they have. So we have S sub K, which are susceptibles who have K contacts per unit time, and I sub K, infectives that have I contacts per unit time. So imagine like S sub one is well contact with one person per day. I sub one is infected people who have contact with one person per day. S sub two would be people who have contact with two people per day. Um, I sub two would be infected people who have contact with two people per day. S is susceptible to all your infections. Okay, so we're just going to break the population up that way. The different people in the population, we're going to put them into boxes. Right? Think about a, a system dynamics model. We put them into separate stocks. Okay? Remember, a system dynamics model you can break the block by by sex or by age, right? You can have children susceptible and adults susceptible, children infected and adults infected. So this is just another way to divide them up. By the number of contacts they have per day. Has it matters. Okay, so, so remember in our original equation, we had this, right? Um, we had a rate of contact times some fraction of people that are infected in the whole population times beta times s. You may remember this, right? Um, and what we're going to do is now we're going to have an equation. Instead of for all I, we're going to have an equation for people with K contacts per unit of time. And guess how many contacts they're going to have per unit of time? People who have K contacts per unit of time are going to have how many contacts per unit of time? I'll give you a hint. People who have K contacts per unit of time are going to have a number of contacts per unit of time that starts with the letter Y. K. K. It starts with K, ladies and gentlemen. They have K contact for you time. So they have their C, their value of C is K. I right? hate like that's how many contacts they have with people per unit time. Okay. And and then we're gonna consider what so what fraction of people in the whole population are infected? They take contact with people. What fraction of people in the population are infected? Well, it's, the infectives are broken up into these categories now, so we've got to sum them up um, to get the total number of infectives that we're at. So this is just a fraction of, of this, is the, this is the total number that are infected, and this is the fraction that are infected. And now we're going to multiply that times the time beta, which is going to basically be just like our normal beta. Um, there's a little bit of things to maybe we want K to be, and maybe they have a certain proportion, not a constant proportion of times K. In any case, there's a beta like term and then S of K. So this is just the same equation, just kind of broken up. Um, just adapted so we're dealing with each people with different numbers of contacts. C becomes K because we're dealing here with uh, people of K contacts per unit time. 
This I is just the sum of all the different subcategories of I. Um, and beta is turned into to this guy here. And, and then these I sub Ks, these effective sweat K connections, they recover with an average time of three. Okay. All I've done is like, I've taken that general equation and I've adapted it here. Okay. Okay. So I've adapted it here and I, you know, C became K. Okay. Um, and the idea here is that, look, people who have K connections, K is really bad. Contact with 500 people per day. That person checking the IDs at the airport, or the person who's um, who's you know uh, delivering packages, or 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 uh, running the bus, or what have you. They have a lot more connections, and so we're going to take the uh, take into account the fact that infection can spread more quickly among them. They have zillions of connections, so they can spread it. They got infected. They'll spread it a lot, a lot further. Okay. Um, uh, and here's people who are susceptible to pain connections. Yeah, you know, they're especially susceptible. Okay. So this is great. This tells us how quickly we turn susceptibles with K connections into infectious. But we're not, we're not quite there yet because here's the thing. Right now, we're judging the prevalence of infection of the whole population, just the sum of the eyes of our head. But we're assuming that our contacts, the contacts of these susceptibles, are equally spread among infection, among, among other people, among these infected. In fact, a susceptible is a lot of connections, maybe like 100 connections per day. A disproportionate number of those will be with others who have lots of connections per day. They'll be with other people who are constantly seeing other people. When checking IDs in the airport, those are not going to be your average person in the population. It's going to be the people going constantly around, flying around, seeing lots of people. So, so people who have lots of connections will tend to have disproportionate mixing with others who have lots of connections. So people have gone and sort of reflected this in, in these equations. Um, now I reflect the fact that, hey, you know, it's not just that the infectives in the population are, are just the sum of these. We know that if we consider contact, who's making contacts in the population, those contacts are disproportionately made by people who have lots of connections. A person with J contacts per day makes J connections per day. So if we compute, this is actually the fraction of all contacts made in the population, the entire population, that are made by infectives. And we're considering that instead of just the, the fraction of people out there that are infected. We're saying, what fraction of contacts being made in the population are being made by infectives? Because the people with lots of contacts may be more likely to be affected. And therefore, I'm going to have a lot more contacts with infections when, when I consider you know, the fact that of all the infects, all the all the contacts occurring in the population, most of those are with infections, for example. They're disproportionate with highly infected. Um, so here we're computing the fraction. Of 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 of, uh, of all contacts that are occurring with uh, with infected individuals. Okay, and that's why there's this J here. These are people of J contacts per unit time, and these are all people in the population who have J contacts per unit time. This will tend to be larger. The larger J is, the more often the the people will be affected. The disproportionate number they'll be affected. Um, okay, so this is a modification here to reflect the fact that it's not just I'm mixing with any old person in the population, I'm disproportionately mixing with people who have lots of connections. Okay, um, so it turns out, and I'm going to have to go quick here because we only have a few more minutes. If you chunk through this, um, what you end up getting is is a situation like this. You end up getting a situation where your basic reproductive number 
instead of just being beta times c times d, becomes instead this. Mu here is the mean, okay? It's the mean number of connections people have per day. That's our old C. C used to be the mean number of connections people have per day. But instead of just being that and the basic reproductive number, now we have this plus term. And it's the ratio of the variance of that divided by the mean. So this is variance over mean. Sigma squared is variance. Sigma is standard deviation. Sigma squared is variance. Okay. Um, and what this is saying is that it's not just the mean that matters. It's not just your average case. It's the variability. It's, it's this variance term. It's the ratio of the variance to the mean. This kind of came in this last two slides they had to go light on. But this is what comes out as the basic reproductive number. Now, the kicker here is that um, for a scale-free network, basically you're always gonna have this be greater than, than one. The, the disease won't die out, even if most people have few connections because this ratio will be very large. Um, and I don't know if you remember, but if we go back to what the mean and variance was for these networks, this is our sigma squared. I should probably put it down here to avoid confusion. I will go actually insert it. Uh, so this is sigma, um, sigma here, uh, sigma squared. It's a bit of a, a bold sigma for my liking. Hey, come on. Um, and this is mu here, okay? Um, this is our mean and standard deviation, mu. Boom. Um, so here's our mu and here's our variance. So this variance, it's the ratio of this to this that ends up being in that second term, the ratio of, of, of that to that. And it turns out that this variance can be very, very large. If if uh, gamma is as we get a little bit put off here, but if gamma is close to three, just a bit bigger than three, this is going to be very very large because the denominator will be very small. Um, and the ratio of these two for a scale-free network is going to be this guy divided by 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 this guy, and what you're going to have is is this. Uh, uh, gamma minus two divided by gamma minus three. And what that can mean is you can get extremely large values of, of this of this quantity here, um, this, this one right here. So it's not the mean that matters, it's the variation. It's the people who have large numbers of connections that dominate. It's this variability, not the mean that matters. It's the folks, it's the tail wagging the dog. It's the variability. And so the essential workers who are exposed, people living in crowded housing, the people who who need to, you know, crowd in, crowd into public transit and and, and mass transit systems. Um, the folks who have to work at jobs where they have constant contact with the population. It's the variation that matters in terms of driving. The basic reproductive number is no longer just the average contact C, beta CD, like we used to have, but it's beta C plus this term that depends on the variance and the ratio of the variance to the mean. This ratio can blow up for scale-free networks if gamma is not large enough. So the kicker, ladies and gentlemen, is scale-free networks capture strong uh, disparity in terms of connections to the platform. And one of the big implications is when you have infection spread across a scale-free network, it spreads a lot, lot faster than you would think possible for the it spreads much faster because of the variability and because of those small fractions of the population that have lots of connections. 
And it depends not only on the mean, but also on this ratio of the variance to the mean. And this is something that I, I do hope you'll remember. And this is why infections like chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and lots of other drugs stick around in our society, despite the fact that if you compute the basic reproductive number based on the average numbers of contacts people in the population have, it's say basic reproductive number is less than one. But no, it's it's a small segment of people who are disproportionately have contacts. And the same thing is true when it comes to airborne spread of certain bugs, when it comes to crowded housing and essential workers, etc. So the variance will go to this, the disparities which often drive a lot of the, the spread, not just the average case. That's all we have time for. This is scale-free networks. I'd like you to remember that, that last point, and I certainly would like you to remember this basic feature of uh, the log-log plot and how it goes down proportional to k to the minus gamma and the ratio of, of having twice the number of contacts to just that number of contacts is the same no matter how k, how large k is. Okay, and heavy tails. That's another. Okay, that's all for today. I hope I'll see perhaps some of you if you're interested tomorrow morning uh, for my talk. Um, and uh, we'll be on big data and HMA modeling. And uh, otherwise, I will be working to see if any uh, others of you have uh, questions during office hours right now, okay? I'll be holding office hours now. Yeah, right now. I will hold them here remotely. And again, I'm not, I'd ask people to be able to, if people want to stay in the room, that's fine. Um, but um, we'll try to avoid coming up to the front. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, so will I share slides? Yes, I'll, good point. I'll post the uh, the slides here. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm going to